Hello, everybody. Welcome to today's Dynamics 365 Tech Talk. Today's topic is integrating third party manufacturing execution system with Dynamics 365 for supply chain management. My name is Brad and I'll be your moderator today. We are broadcasting this session through Teams Live events and the audio can be heard through your device speakers. This session is being recorded on behalf of the Microsoft Corporation. When you join this event, your name, email address, and or phone number may be viewable by other session participants in the attendee list. By joining, you're agreeing to this experience. The recording will be available on the Tech Talks Community Dynamics page within five business days. If you have questions for the presenters or need support, please use the Q&A panel located on the right side of your screen. Our presenters will be responding to your questions throughout the event and during the Q&A segment near the end. Thank you for your patience during these announcements. Presenting for us today from Microsoft, we have Sachin Gandhi, Principal Solutions Architect, and Vlad Grossman, Software Engineer. Sachin, over to you. Thanks, Brad. Um, uh, hello, everyone. Uh, today we are here to talk about uh, how we integrate uh, third party MES systems uh, with Dynamics 365 for supply chain management. Uh, so, if we sort of look at uh, our customer base, uh, we have uh, different industries, uh, distribution, a lot of manufacturing from automotive uh, to pharmaceutical to food uh, to consumer uh, goods. Um, and what we kind of see is the manufacturing uh, can be really simple, where it's just about reporting, uh, you know, uh, time and sort of communicating what production orders are available to execute on. And in some cases, this could be really advanced where the manufacturing execution system is actually fully integrated with uh, the assembly line or with the machinery uh, or is very specific to that industry. So when we run into those kind of scenarios, uh, there is uh, uh, obviously a consideration that needs to be made whether to use uh, the EMEA system that is available inside Dynamics 365 or uh, use either an existing EMEA system that's already in place or replace that with a more industry specific or machine integrated EMEAs um, out there. And there are a lot of ISVs out there uh, that uh, specialize in various uh, types of EMEA systems that serve different industries. Uh, so the challenge that uh, we typically run into with our customers uh, in this scenario is okay, it should be integrated, should we use the out of the box functionality uh, in the NX365? And if we have to integrate, then what is the integration complexity? What is the effort in terms of uh, doing that integration? What is the time required? Uh, and then once all of that is developed, then uh, what's the ongoing maintenance uh, cost and, and upkeep? And also, uh, as the integration messages are flowing through, if there is any troubleshooting needed, how to kind of do that, right? So, and we have seen, you know, different ISVs kind of solve this problem in different ways. Uh, sometimes they customize uh, the Dynamics 365, sometimes they have a lot of middleware to try to be able to kind of uh, build this integration on. And that's kind of the problem statement we looked at and sort of say, how can we simplify it for our ISVs, our customers and our partners to build uh, this integration with MES systems? Uh, so if we are kind of looking at our options here, uh, then the first option uh, where no customization is needed and everything out of the box in E365 is the production flow execution interface. Uh, we have an excellent functionality built in terms of communicating to the shop floor what production orders are available uh, to be executed on, uh, you know, uh, for the shop floor workers to clock in, uh, start a production order, uh, report progress on it, uh, report as finished, uh, you know, report uh, material consumption, uh, and, and end those production orders. And it can be done through this touch-friendly uh, interface uh, that we have now enabled. If you want to know more about this out of the box functionality about this production flow and execution interface, uh, then I have also included a link at the end of the deck uh, uh, to one of our tech talks that we did previously 
specifically on the production uh, flow or execution interface if we take a look at that. Uh, but if we kind of run into the scenario where uh, out of the box functionality uh, uh, is not uh, really the, the best option, and we must integrate with uh, another MES system, uh, instead of kind of you know customizing everything and building the APIs in D365, we have now enabled uh, out of the box framework uh, and APIs. Uh, that can help you easily integrate uh, your manufacturing execution system with V365. Uh, here's a link uh, which we can open up and you can take a look at the full documentation that we have published. Uh, but kind of looking at a little bit of uh, the mechanisms around integration, uh, uh, integrations could be uh, to and from FNO where data is either flowing in or out of uh, financial operations. Uh, it could be a synchronous uh, type of integration or an asynchronous type of integration. Uh, and if you kind of look at then sort of, you know, what uh, are the different types that, that are supported in, in finance and operation. Uh, one is business event where if something, a state changes of a production order in, in D365 to say a production order goes from a started state to release state, uh, we can raise a business event that then an external application can uh, uh, subscribe to uh, in an asynchronous way uh, and basically react to that and that business event. And then the other mechanism we have is our uh, data entities, which we can uh, call uh, to either import or export data or call over raw data or call over uh, the uh, data management uh, uh, framework APIs also. And then we also have uh, our traditional web services uh, that we can call in and we can build a, a web service in, in D365 and, and have it call from the external application. Uh, what we have done here is kind of a little bit unique in terms of you know, messages. They're kind of similar to web services, but they act more in an asynchronous way where a message comes in to finance and operation, it's queued up, uh, and then it's kind of asynchronously processed uh, in, in, inside of finance and operation. And that's what we have added as part of this uh, framework. Uh, and that's what you can leverage uh, in terms of integrating uh, your MES system. Uh, business events, again, like I said, a lightweight event notifications uh, that you can send to any external application that can subscribe to it. Could be very simple, HTTP endpoint, or you can go through via service bus or even create or even hub or, or block storage. Uh, uh, here's a link to the documentation uh, on the same. And then uh, data entities, uh, we have lots of data entities that are available out of the box. So if you're looking at product information, bills of material, route, uh, we have entities for all of that uh, already. So all you have to basically do is uh, call the, the data entity or REST API or, or data in a synchronous way, or you can also basically go and define a project in D365 uh, in which you can add the, the, the data entities uh, for which you need the data and basically call the data management framework API uh, to basically either import or export that data. Uh, so that's uh, a tried and tested mechanism in terms of importing and exporting data. The, the thing with data entities is mostly exchange of data not really kind of uh, a business logic that that you can activate unless you kind of go and write uh, action uh, uh, on on the OData, uh, custom action on the OData um, call. Uh, so it's mostly data, not so much logic, but in some cases in the MES scenario, we might not just need to go and create a route card journal, we might also need to go and post that journal or a bomb journal. Uh, so so that's why we, we, we need to exchange data, but we also need to uh, take the business uh, action uh, inside of finance and operation. And that's why uh, the messages uh, framework that we have enabled uh, helps us do that. So uh, the messages uh, would uh, are not just able to kind of, you know, exchange data, but also uh, invoke logic uh, in finance and operations. Uh, so any external app can call into that API. Uh, and based on that API, uh, the right action will be taken. Uh, messages are processed asynchronously. Like I said earlier, uh, we will take the message in, uh, we will queue it up, 
and then we will basically have a bad job running that you know processes that message in the necessary order. And then if there are uh, you know uh, any messages that uh, have any kind of problems getting processed, we have a dashboard. Uh, to view those messages, uh, retry processing those messages, and even edit those messages. So if we, if we need to troubleshoot anything, uh, there is an inbuilt dashboard for that. The few APIs that we're supporting right now uh, as part of this first release is uh, basically messages that will enable you to start uh, and end the production order, uh, report uh, as finished, uh, you know, uh, consume materials uh, or your bomb consumption, post your bomb consumption journal, and then uh, report time and labor. Uh, so basically, uh, post your uh, rough cut journal. So if we kind of compare these mechanisms, right? Business events uh, are basically uh, an event uh, triggering something uh, outside of FNL. Uh, so it's it's mostly going out of FNL. Uh, it's it's mostly asynchronous. Uh, uh, instant notification. Uh, we don't have to wait for schedule integration to run. Uh, it's it's as, as it happens, uh, it will be delivered. And then uh, they're lightweight. Uh, they can include a lot of data, uh, but uh, the payload is uh, small for each business event. So that could be one of the limitations. And then uh, examples like here, we have production or release business event, uh, or when an alert is generated in FNO that can trigger the business event. Uh, there, are, there are a lot of box you can go read the documentation of business events uh, and those different scenarios you can use them for. Data entities, like I said, it will be both a bi-directional import and export of data and be done synchronously or asynchronously. Um, uh, and then, uh, there are a lot of data entities that are really available out of the box. Uh, so if you're just using uh, one of the box uh, available entities, then it's kind of an effortless way of reading and writing over uh, a REST API. And you can also call uh, the data management framework API if you're kind of trying to exchange data in bulk. Uh, again, like I said earlier, uh, data entities um, uh, generally, mostly exchange of data, not triggering of a business process or the logic in D365. And, and, and if you need to kind of do something, your custom field and things like that, or you need to trigger some logic, you may need to go and then extend those data entities. And we have data entities like 2000 plus data entities out of the box. Uh, some of them release products. Uh, so if a system needs to know about, uh, you know, details about a product, you can look at the release product V2 entity. Or if you want to know about the customer, we can look at the customer entity. And if you want to look at what is being on hand, the inventory available in FNO, we can look at the inventory house uh, inventory status on hand uh, uh, entity as well. Messages uh, messages are uh, coming into FNO, uh, so they're kind of you know data coming into FNO uh, and they're asynchronous. Uh, these will invoke logic, uh, business logic in, in D365. So in our MES scenario, we can start a production order or stop a production order or, uh, uh, or, or you know, report as finished. Uh, queuing uh, is flexible uh, with ordering, and then there's the dashboard for troubleshooting. So those are some of the advantages. And then uh, currently the limitation is that out of the box, we have only enabled it for this MES scenario for production orders. Uh, but other messages uh, could be implemented uh, by customers and partners uh, and extended on. And then uh, examples of this is like start production order, uh, report as finished uh, here. So, so to enable this functionality, uh, you have to be at least on 10.0.23. That's the version we have first uh, released this in. And you will also have to enable uh, the manufacturing execution system integration feature in feature management. And uh, to integrate and authenticate your integration messages, you will have to go and create an app ID and secret in your Azure Active Directory and then set that up in, in the 365. So the authentication flows uh, properly based on the app ID and secret. Um, if you look at 
the integration events and data flow uh, that this framework enables us uh, for. So the first one is uh, release production order. So if we're kind of looking at it from a procure to pay uh, stream, uh, we will run our master planning. Typically, master planning will generate your plan production orders. We'll form those production orders. Those form production orders will either be in an estimated state uh, or uh, and then at some point, uh, those production orders will be then released to the production floor to go and execute on. So that's the event uh, that we have enabled this and even we have enabled when production order is released. Uh, uh, the MAS system can look for that business event for release of production order, and that's when the MES system will know what is SNL making available for the shop floor to execute on. Um, and once it receives that information uh, about the production order that, that it should go and execute on, uh, the MES system may need uh, reference data, like data about the item, uh, the build material, uh, the route, and for that, uh, the MES system can either make an OData call or call the data entity and the data management framework API to get uh, the item information, the bomb information, and the route information, or any other kind of information that it may need uh, from, from FNL. Uh, so now at this point, uh, the MES system has all the information that it can actually go and start executing on the production order. Uh, so when it actually goes and starts executing on the production order, um, uh, it can send a message to uh, FNL. And that will make sure that the MES system uh, and FNO is in sync and the production order status is in, in both, both the systems kind of match and stay in sync. And, and we know when exactly that production order started. Uh, also, as uh, production progresses and uh, uh, we start producing finished goods, uh, the MES system can send uh, a set of messages again uh, to report production. Uh, this is sort of similar to posting your uh, report as finished journal, um, and it can send item, product, dimensions, quantity, all kinds of information there uh, that's needed. Um, and as uh, the MES system is consuming the raw material um, based on your crushing principle, uh, if it's a manual, uh, the MES system can also basically keep us updated on what raw material is consuming and start posting the bump and motion journal as well. Uh, similarly, uh, as each operation is done in the MES, uh, the MES can report time on each operation and basically post the route card journal as well. And uh, uh, once the MES system completes the production order, the MES system can send a message to end the production order in D365. So that's the flow that we have enabled using this framework, and, and hopefully this makes uh, integrating uh, MES systems much, much easier where our customers, partners, and ISVs uh, don't have to you know, go and code these APIs themselves uh, in the 365 and manage them over time. This is something now available out of the box. Uh, here is a screenshot of the monitoring and troubleshooting uh, page in D365. So here you can see the message type and messages are being kind of getting queued in here. And you can select these messages and kind of look at the details uh, of that message. Uh, and then you can process the message or, you know, uh, uh, create the journal manual, uh, create the journal and try to post it manually or, you know, do any editing that you need to do to that data to, to get it posted. Um, so, so that's the the monitoring uh, screen that that we have built uh, uh, to you know uh, troubleshoot uh, if there's something that's getting stuck. So, without uh, further delay, I will um, hand over to my colleague Vlad here uh, for giving you a quick demo uh, of this new functionality. Yes, thank you very much, Sachin. Hello, everyone. And yeah, Sachin has pretty much told you everything you need to know about uh, what messages and our other integration features can do. And I'm just here to show you how really easy they are to use. And don't just take my word for it. We also showed it, uh, previewed it to a few partners and they've had the exact same feedback. So uh, I want to show just quickly 
how messages work in practice, but also show a bit about the other two integration functionalities that uh, Sachin talked about and also a bit about the setup. I won't go into that too much because all of the uh, sample code and demo will be available to all of you with on GitHub and it also includes step by step instructions for all the configuration I have done for it, starting with uh, the Adjusted Dynamics development environment to setting up all of the authentication and the configuration and everything. So just quickly, all I've had to do was create an app registration here in Azure and there I just have an application ID and a secret. And once I have that, I can just go into here into Azure Active Directory applications in Dynamics, map that client ID to a user ID. I also need to change the default company of the user that I will be using. Um, in addition to this, I have also set up business events. They're very simple. We have this business event catalog where you can select some business events and activate them. You also need to create an endpoint, which I have done here. And as such as mentioned, creating an endpoint can be as simple as defining an uh, HTTP URL that we post the uh, events to, or you can go in a, a bit more uh, uh, a bit better if you use some Azure technologies because there, for example, you can queue up messages in case your recipient goes down, they have better resilience. And the way to set this up is uh, also very simple. Here I have created a uh, service bus. It's called a service bus namespace. And then from here, I just need uh, uh, the name of the service bus. I need a uh, connection string, which I get by clicking here. Um, I also created a uh, key vault that contains this connection string, and I've also created a another application registration which has access to this key vault. And all of this information I've just input into here. If I click new and select either service bus queue, then we'll just input all the data here, and there you have your endpoints. So without further ado, let's see what we can do. Um, this first app that I create, I just put that client app ID here and the secrets uh, in here, and that's really all I need to do to be able to authenticate. This is the Dynamics URL. And there, if we go into the, app, uh, the actual demo code, what I'm doing here is I use an auth helper to get an authentication header using the information I put into this client configuration file, and then I just have a few examples here. So let's see what happens when we run this. It can usually take a minute at startup just to uh, authenticate and start everything up. Oh, that went fast. So here we can see there is one line that we basically need to write to retrieve all the information that we need in the external mess system about a certain production order. So we have this production order headers entity, and as I mentioned, we have many thousands of entities out of the box, basically all kinds of data that you might want out of dynamics. And in addition, all of that data is linked between each other. So here, right, expand production order bomb lines, released product V2, production order route jobs. That means that besides just getting a production order header, I also get all the uh, other information that I might need for processing that production order. So here I'm retrieving production order with number P000173. And let's see what I'm getting out of that. So here is the production order. Here we have the number, the name, a bunch of other information. And we also have these things that I have expanded. So for example, we have these route jobs. This is information about everything that goes into producing this, whatever, what resources used for job, the ID, how many hours it's supposed to take. Similarly, we have the bomb lines. This is the raw materials that goes into producing this production order and uh, of course as you expect we have all the dimensions where you would find this we have the 
name of the form. We have the number of the item that will be consumed and so on. And the final thing that I've expanded here is released product V2. So let's see what we're seeing here. And this is, of course, the final product that we are supposed to produce in this production order. So let's see what kind of information we have about that. Yep, here this D003 is the product that we're supposed to produce in this production order. And this all through these one, two, three lines of code. Now, as I also mentioned, the entities are not limited to just retrieving data. We can also update data. So here we're retrieving another production order, 311. And then we are just adding one at the end of its name. Yep, and that's how quickly that worked. And now we can see that this 311 now suddenly has a one after its name. So it's really no more difficult than that. And of course, there are a bunch of other ways of using entities, uh, which are more in bulk, but this is the, really the basic of it. And we have uh, an auto-generated library that allows you to just write code like this with link queries. So let's continue beyond production orders. What else we can look at? So here, for example, we have the release product directly, we just retrieve uh information about d001 and here we're going the other way we would expand the production order headers so here instead of looking what we're supposed to produce or what raw materials goes into production order we're looking at a release product and instead looking at all the production orders for producing that Let's see production. yes and here we can see that we actually have 55 different production orders for producing this D001 item. It's our main demo item, so that's why there are so many of them. And a final examples, we can look at we can look at sales orders as well. And this is exactly the same kind of code. We have an entity for sales order headers and here we're just expanding all the lines. So the sales order header naturally contains, for example, the address that you want to deliver it to and so on. And while the individual sales order lines contain the actual things that you want to sell and their item number and where you can find them in the warehouse and so on and so on. And here, once again, this we have an example where we can update things. So for example, uh, you have an external mass system, you are producing a production order, you can see that you're going to have some delays. You might want to update the expected delivery date on the related sales order. And of course, you can find the sales order from the production order and vice versa. So that's yep. that's really how easy you can work with data entities. Yeah, but before we get to the state where we want to retrieve information about the production order, we might want to actually retrieve the business. We might want to actually receive the business event that a production order has been released. And this is also very simple. So this code above is if you want to have an HTTP endpoint. And this is how simple it is to listen to a service bus. Here is the connection string that we could retrieve from Azure. We also show that within that uh, service bus, we create a queue and that's just giving it a name. Specify that queue name here, we specify a handler for receiving a business event or, or uh, error handling, and then we just start processing. And the message, uh, the business event handler here is also very simple. We uh, decode it from JSON here. We're only interested in a uh, type of business event and then we write out the body. So let's see what happens when we run this. Yep, right now we don't have any business events in queue, but let's see what happens if, for example, we want to create 
I need a production order, scan for D001. Created it, then we need to estimate it. And then we go ahead and release it. Sorry, I'm just my laptop is covering my screen a bit. <laughs> there we release it. There it is released and now. Within a few minutes, hopefully we should have an event here. There we go. We have a business event. And what we can see here is we can see the type of business event. We can see a bit of uh, background information that we don't need. We can see the company, the the number of the production order, the date when it was released, and the type of the production order. I think it's standard or batch. So we can see there's not that much information in the business event itself, and that's also how they are supposed to work. If you need further information, which you probably do about this production order, then you use entities for that. And similarly, you can also get a business event, for example, if uh, your messages were to fail. Here, for example, I have a start production order queued up for production order 210. But, oh no, production order 210 is already reported as finished, so it doesn't make much sense to start it. And there it's already failed twice, and I've set it up to a retry three times. So when you process it again, it should fail again. Let's have a look. So normally, of course, you would have a batch job running all of these, but I've disabled that just for demonstration purposes. And here we see, of course, that production status report is finished, does not, does not allow start. And now this message moved to the fail state. And if we look here, we got a business event. This is an alert event. And the way you set up alerts is just going through any form and click options, create a custom alert. And there you can choose uh, any kind of settings you want to want what uh, when you want the alert to be created. And it's basically for any kind of uh, data change. So here we have set it but whenever a message goes into the failed state, we send this alert and you see it's, it's an alert event. We have a bunch of things configured. These alerts can, for example, be sent as an email. They can also be sent in on the notification center for a certain Dynamics user. And we can also send a business event, which is what's happening here. So we see that uh, uh, the table message state and the field name state has changed. Therefore, we got this business event. Under key value one, we see the production order that this message relates to. And on key value two, we see the timestamp of that. And we also get a deep link here, which if you display to a user and they click it, they would just go there directly to this form with the correct message already pre-selected. And we can also have and the message details. This is the suggested name of that link. So that's really how simple it is with business events. Now let's move on to the actual messages. So what's happening in the messages is perhaps the simplest. Of all these things, we once again get, use Alt Helper to get an authentication header based on the uh, app information I put in client configuration. Then we have the URL to the sys message service, which we just appended to the Dynamics URL. And here we create the message and send it. And uh, due to how it works internally, we need to have uh, we need to basically JSON encode it twice. We have an outer message that specifies uh, the company ID, the queue name, the type of the message. And this is just to determine where the message will go. And then we have uh, an internal message content, which is this. And for a production order start message, the content is very, very simple. You specify the production order number. And you can, of course, also specify, for example, the uh, date when you start this production order, just so you have everything synced up. Of course, for other message types, such as uh, uh, picking lease or bomb or uh, report finished, you have a lot more data in this uh, uh, in this message. Uh, you, can, you have uh, a bunch of lines, for example, if you report uh, 
multiple items finished or consume multiple items, you can do that as part of the same message. So let's see what happens when we run this. Yep, that's it. Message posted. And now if we refresh here, we have a new message here. Right now it's in the queued state, normally we would have a we would have a batch job that would every few minutes, depending on how you set it up, would pick this up and process that message. And if we were to process now, that would start this production order. We have a few more useful things on this screen. So we have a log for what happened with the production or so with the message. For example, we are this, so we can click log here and we we'll get the actual error message because uh, you would normally click process here without a batch of doing that. Um, you can also look at the contents of the message here on the start production order. There's not much content. It shows all of the available fields. You can see the raw content for other messages. There's a bit more information and here you can, for example, see a table of all the lines. You also see that there is a whole bunch of parameters you can specify here to customize it to your heart's content. But the important here thing here is that the item you want to pick is M001 and you're consuming three of these items. Um, you can, of course, uh, sort and search here as you want. And uh, the final useful thing that I wanted to show is that when a message has failed, you probably need to do something about it uh, here for the route card that failed for a bit more complicated reason. So let's see what happens if we click log here and click message details. So here you see that we forgot something on this route card message. Operation number must be specified. Cost category per time is not specified. Resource number is not specified. Here something was wrong with the message. It could also be that something is wrong with uh, the state of your system, such as you're trying to consume inventory that you don't have, which you might want to fix elsewhere in Dynamics. But in this case, the issue is with the message itself. Or what we can do in this case is this button, create journal and post manually. And this is basically about editing the message. But instead of having a business user try to edit the JSON message manually, what we do is we use internal Dynamics functionality to create this route card journal according to what is in the message. And then we can actually use this regular familiar interface to specify exactly what we need to do. So for example, we forgot the operation number. So we want operation number 10. So there's probably some other operation numbers defined here. And we need to define all the types and quantities that we forgot here. And then we can just click post as we would uh, in a regular Dynamics flow. Oh, right, that's because I entered in here. Yep, I think that's really all I had to show. That's what there is to the messages. And I hope that you agree with me that it doesn't get much simpler than this. So with that, Back to you, Sachin. Uh, thanks, Vlad. Uh, sorry, take a minute uh, to turn uh, the mute off. Uh, so thanks for the excellent demo. Uh, we have been uh, busy kind of working with a couple of our ISVs uh, to actually help them uh, use this framework uh, to integrate uh, uh, their MES with Dynamics 365. So one of the uh, the ISVs that we have been working on is Optin. Optins uh, specializes in additive manufacturing. Uh, when you're kind of doing 3D printing and kind of have to nest uh, uh, your parts uh, uh, in a in a 3D sort of way, um, and they really have some really good AI there. Uh, so we have one customer uh, that uh, had this need and we sort of uh, partnered with uh, Optum uh, and helped them kind of leverage this framework and they were able to build uh, the integration uh, way very quickly uh, using this. And then uh, similarly, uh, we are working with uh, Aegis software um, uh, with the factory logic uh, MES. 
Uh, and they were also able to utilize this framework in terms of uh, getting their integration uh, done uh, in, the, in the faster way. Um, so I know there were some questions around what MES, uh, you have a, a multitude of MES that you know, suit your industry and your needs. Um, if the out of the box MES is not enough, uh, so uh, if you try to integrate those MES, you can also uh, basically follow the same pattern now. Um, and have to do less work um, because we have enabled these APIs. Um, this slide has the the links to various documentation. So uh, basically, the 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 doc site where we have kind of documented the APIs uh, that we are just kind of walk you through. Uh, we also have uh, this tech talk on the production floor execution interface. So if you want to use the bus functionality, that's where you need to go. Another blog about uh, this uh, this uh, framework. And last one is basically a link to a GitHub site where all the code that uh, Vlad just walked you through uh, is available as a sample code for you to basically take. And if you try to build it, you can kind of use it that as a starting point and then uh, revise it from there. Uh, so those are uh, the resources uh, you can go look at uh, if you're interested in this. Um, with that, uh, I think I'm kind of done with my presentation and uh, we are happy to take uh, more questions. I know there has been an active uh, Q&A uh, going uh, simultaneously, uh, but if you have any specific questions, we can take them up uh, and, and uh, avoid any answers. So please feel feel free to just type away your questions in the Q&A panel. Um, also, I guess uh, based on the question that I was reading in the the, the first version of the tech talk we did yesterday, I mean, I guess some questions around extensibility. Um, so I guess uh, we would just want to answer that that yes, there are ways to extend and create new message types, uh, but if you run across scenarios where something you can extend, then uh, please go ahead and log an extensibility request through Lifecycle Services. That way we know what scenario you're trying to enable and then we can help you in terms of uh, figuring out what's the best way for you to uh, enable that scenario and if there is a extension point that, that we need to add for you. Um, but right now, I think uh, our engineering team is trying to keep a close eye on this and, and keep things a little tight, uh, but as we learn more, uh, we will probably open this up for more uh, extensibility going forward. Um, Thanks, for Sashin. Yeah. Uh, on a related question that was also on the chat, mm -hmm. what if they would like to create other messages? Not extend the existing ones, but create new messages. So uh, Leonard or Ryan? Yeah, I, can uh, take, I can take that one. Yes, that should be possible by extending uh, the message type and uh, the message queue. So we are working on a on a block uh, where we walk through how to, to do this. It's a bit out of the Q&A here to try and explain it, but it, the short answer is yes, you should be able to create your own messages. Thanks, Leonard. And also similar on extending, uh, there's a question that is asking, is there any plan to extend this message framework to other areas? That's a good question. Um, I would, I'm hesitant to answer yes and uh, or no. Uh, so the answer will be, we will use this this message framework when it makes sense to enable the business scenarios that we are delivering in upcoming uh, releases. Yes, so this is another framework for us to to integrate um, in in the Cloud Edge project. This framework is used very heavily. So I, I guess if uh, any uh, customers have or people logged in today have any feedback in terms of what other scenarios you would like to see a similar framework or similar APIs being available, uh, please uh, share that feedback. You can type it in the chat right now or share it with us offline. But we are we are willing to learn and see where else uh, we can uh, make integration easier with, with Dynamics. And as you were saying, Leonard, it's a framework that is used by the Cloud on Edge. 
There was a question uh, before asking, is it also working with the scale units? So the, the message framework in general is definitely working uh, for the scale units. Um, however, the messages that are implemented here for uh, the mess uh, third party integration, they are not all supported in the same release uh, as what has been demonstrating here. Exactly, that's what I answered as well. Okay, and if you're so interested, yeah, I answered to all the questions so far in the chat. Uh, so if you're interested as well, if you have any customer, if you're a partner and have a customer uh, that would like to use the scale units and this mess third party integration, please uh, let us know. We're interested in knowing about it. Yeah, I see one last uh, question here around uh, can the framework be used in on-prem implementations? And uh, if I'm right here, right, uh, this is an API that we have enabled, and I think there shouldn't be a problem calling it uh, even if you're on-prem. Uh, is that right, Lena? Uh, no, that shouldn't. Like the message processing that we are building on top on here is just X plus plus code uh, utilizing the batch framework. Right. And then so, the external communication that Vlad's shown is simply consuming this code and calling uh, the, the yeah. APIs. So the, so the simple answer is yes, it will also work if you have an on-prem deployment. Correct. For messages and for entities, it should work in exactly the same way. I can't guarantee that 100% for business events. So as we saw, there are a few different uh, uh, ways of delivering these business events and not all might work in on-premise, but uh, at the very least, you should be able to use the uh, HTTPS uh, endpoint for business events on-premise as well. Now that we have talked on the framework, uh, let's pass to a couple of new questions on the functionality. There's a question asking, can the pick list consumption message auto reconcile on hand inventory between MES and D365? So, uh, can the pick list the consumption message auto reconcile um, on hand inventory, right? So, the pick list uh, from the MES system will be sending us a message uh, to say what the MES is consuming. And then we'll be posting that against uh, uh, D365 as a bomb consumption journal. So, it basically will work like how you're posting a bomb consumption journal. If, let's say, you are picking more item than actually available in the on hand inventory, then that processing probably will will fail and you will have to troubleshoot that and sort of adjust uh, the inventory uh, to be able to kind of get that posted. But uh, we don't have sort of, you know, well, I'm not sure how the, the auto reconcile will come into picture there uh, because uh, all the message we'll be doing is basically posting a bomb consumption journal. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And adding to that, you know, when the message is processed, it's actually using the same logic as Dynamics would do mm -hmm. when posting the consumption. So in case the consumption would fail, let's say you're picking five pieces of a component and there's actually not five pieces in inventory, then you would be given the same error message as you would when posting it from the application. So then in that case, you can have a user, your production responsible, for example, going and finding out what happened with those pieces, if they were actually just not registered as inventory, or what happened with those, and manually edit the message if needed. Oh. I 
Okay, the next question is uh, whom? Uh, I think somebody's asking for contacts uh, with Octum and, and Aegis. Uh, so obviously they are independent ISVs, uh, so you can go to their website and, and get in contact and get in touch with them. But if you want us to help, you can drop me an offline message uh, and uh, I will happy to connect you with them. Last one is. Yeah, adding another scenario. EDI for sales order PLM systems. Yeah, I think uh, that's that's good feedback. A lot of the PLM system integrations I have seen uh, is uh, more uh, kind of done through data entities uh, today. Um, but uh, we can think of, of exactly you know what what messages uh, would help in the PLM scenario. Um, I think the EDI one is also interesting, um, uh, which we need to kind of look at the whole EDI side of things, uh, sales order shipments and, and all of that. And typically, uh, what we see customers use like data masons uh, as the EDI uh, provider there. Uh, so yeah, I mean, out of the box, I think there is a lot of room in terms of improving the ADI story, but uh, we can look at uh, if messages can help there. Mm -hmm. Adding on PLM as well, in general, the integration between PLM and ERP is master data uh, that doesn't necessarily need some processing as such, mm -hmm. as in this case that the messages have a manufacturing meaning and then you have to post journals. Uh, for those kind of uh, data integrations, in general, you don't need the queuing capabilities. That is the strongest point of this framework. You can handle any spike of messages coming from your MES. In the case that you have many reported as finished, for example, then you can just handle those in the ERP. But if you have a scenario that you have, like, you know, if you have more ideas on the PLM, like, please drop us a message and we'll be happy to discuss with you. On functionality as well, then we have another question. Can it be sent back from the MES a consumption of an alternative or new item comparing with the bomb lines? And in general, the integration tried to find the transaction of the corresponding bomb lines when registering the bomb consumption. So I think uh, if the scenario is that somehow the MES is consuming an alternate item uh, instead of what is uh, was listed on the bill of material, uh, then I think we should be able to still uh, use messages and post that because you are basically posting a bomb consumption journal and you're saying I'm using a different item. Uh, I think I think that should should work. Uh, I don't know if anybody else has a comment on that. Yeah, yes. that's that is that is correct. That mm -hmm. uh, you can consume anything basically through these messages. And uh, yes, I believe that if, when you're consuming something that is in the bomb, then it matches those uh, those uh, transactions. Yes, in general, it is as well the MES that controls what is happening on the shop floor. On the shop floor. So in case there is any last minute changes, any material availability in the shop floor, it will always be MES controlling this. And then it has to be able to report this back into ERP of what was actually consumed. So yes, the messages are able to do so. Yep. I think the next one is, uh, will those error messages also be visible in MES system somehow? So I think that's what Vlad tried to show in the demo, is that let's say uh, you send a message to uh, D365 in your MES system, and then that fails. So on that uh, troubleshooting form, uh, you could set up an alert to say when a message fails, generate an alert and then hook up a business event on that alert. And then your MES system can get notified if a message fails uh, and then the MES system can take the subsequent action uh, from there on. But the alert framework will be the feedback loop uh, to the MES in case the message uh, fails. 
Yeah, I'm not 100% if the actual if the error message itself will be part of that uh, business events. We'll need to look into that if it's possible, that's possible to set up somehow. But uh, at the very least, you can still set it up. This, for example, send an email when that happens, so it's possible to find that out. I think there's a suggestion on uh, having a similar a sort of APIs on quality system. I think that makes sense to me. Uh, because if you have a different uh, software that you're using for managing your quality orders, then uh, we can have some APIs that can enable uh, the two systems to stay in sync. So that's a good suggestion, I think. Mm -hmm. Yes, it is. Then there's another one that is asking, does the message for reporting as finished and or start manage any flashing principle setup? For example, bomb consumption set at the end? Uh, yes, the messages have a field for uh, setting the flashing principles. So if you don't want to use the one that is configured by default. And then as well for functionality, do you also plan to expose some options to start finish jobs through all data actions on the production order header data entity? Um, I believe since we now have the messages to do this, I'm not aware of any specific plans to enable such functionality. If you have a uh, scenario where you believe this will be a better fit than the messaging framework, then please let us know. And once again, we'll be happy to discuss your options. Mm -hmm. I think uh, the, the, the thinking through that a little bit, right? If we just create an action to go and, uh, uh, you know, take uh, the subsequent uh, or run the subsequent logic in in uh, in D365 and done that through adding um, an action on the old data, then that will run synchronously. So your call to FNO will be synchronous, and you won't leverage the queuing mechanism. So. Uh, that I guess would be the difference. Otherwise, in both cases, we are basically, you know, um, sending uh, a JSON message or a no data message to to the 365. But uh, with the messages framework, you get the benefit of queuing. So if you have spikes in your load, uh, FNO can still kind of process it uh, and, and not get it truly impacted by the spike. We have seen in other implementations where there's a lot of no data calls and spikes in no data calls that. Uh, you know, creates problems, and then we have some throttling on the data calls where you might get a 429 uh, code back uh, if you are calling too many or later calls at the same time. So I feel like the messages frameworks kind of gives you that queuing mechanism, which is an added uh, benefit. Exactly, and you know, just abstracting ourselves from the technology and you know, start and finish jobs. Uh, let me add on the usual scenario that we've seen so far is that when having both MES and ERP, in general, MES is the one that is actually controlling the shop floor. It's actually controlling the specific jobs and activities to be performed in the production facility. So in general, it has much more detailed control of the job management. In most of the cases, this information is not needed to be sent to the ERP. ERP is OK, is you know, uh, business wise enough information, having just the state on the production order, like start, finish, and then quantity is reported as finished or scrapped, because that is the information that is going to be used farther on from ERP to be able to change inventory on hand to be able to know if the parts have been produced and then can be shipped. But as such, ERP in general does not need to have the specific job. Yeah. Start or finish. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Beatrice. I think we are uh, coming clo close to the end of the hour, so I'll uh, like to hand this over to Brad. Uh, yeah. Brad, please take it over. Thank you. 
Uh, to all of our attendees out there, I've posted a link to a short survey in the Q&A panel. We'd like to get your feedback on today's session and to hear what you'd like to see in future events. Thank you for your participation there. As a reminder, the recording of today's session will be available on the Tech Talks Community Dynamics page within five business days. And finally, I'd like to extend a big thank you to our presenters and audience for joining us today.